ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣುರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು so in the bhagavad gita we are studying the 12th chapter bhakti yoga and uh, we saw that uh, sri krishna after saying that bhakti is bhakti yoga is a, is better in the sense that it is easier than the path of uh, uh, of pure jnana the pure uh, path of knowledge of realization that i am brahman and then having said that he proceeds to define uh, what it means in bhakti yoga what's done what is the practice and what is the result so he says in verses in 8 9 10 and 11 and 12 so these are these verses tell us the range of practices recommended by sri krishna in bhakti yoga there are four four levels let us say four levels of practice uh, we will chant those four four verses actually um from 8 to 11 and then we'll, we will proceed i'll c- make a few more comments about it we we talked about it last time uh you can chant after me ಮಯ್ಯೇವ ಮನ ಆಧತ್ಸ್ವ ಮಯ್ಯೇವ ಮನ ಆಧತ್ಸ್ವ ಮಯಿ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ನಿವೇಶಯ ಮಯಿ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ನಿವೇಶಯ ನಿವಸಿಷ್ಯಸಿ ಮಯ್ಯೇವ ನಿವಸಿಷ್ಯಸಿ ಮಯ್ಯೇವ ಅತ ಊರ್ಧ್ವ ನ ಸಂಶಯ ಅತ ಊರ್ಧ್ವ ನ ಸಂಶಯ ಅಥ ಚಿತ್ತ ಸಾಧಾತು ಅಥ ಚಿತ್ತ ಸಾಧಾತು ನ ಶಕ್ನೋಷಿ ಮಯಿ ಸ್ಥಿರ ನ ಶಕ್ನೋಷಿ ಮಯಿ ಸ್ಥಿರ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಯೋಗೇನ ತೋ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಯೋಗೇನ ತೋ ಮಾಪ್ತು ಧನಂಜಯ ಮಾಪ್ತು ಧನಂಜಯ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸಪ್ಯಸಮರ್ಥೋಸಿ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸಪ್ಯಸಮರ್ಥೋಸಿ ಮತ್ಕರ್ಮ ಪರಮೋ ಭವ ಮತ್ಕರ್ಮ ಪರಮೋ ಭವ ಮದಿ ಕರ್ಮಿ ಮದಿ ಕರ್ಮಿ ಕುರುವನ್ ಸಿದ್ಧಿ ವಾಪ್ಸ್ಯಸಿ ಕುರುವನ್ ಸಿದ್ಧಿ ವಾಪ್ಸ್ಯಸಿ ಅಥೈತದಪ್ಯಶಕ್ ತೋಸಿ ಅಥೈತದಪ್ಯಶಕ್ತೋಸಿ ಕರ್ತು ಮದ್ಯೋಗಮಾಶ್ರಿತ ಕರ್ತು ಮದ್ಯೋಗಮಾಶ್ರಿತ ಸರ್ವಕರ್ಮಫಲತ್ಯಾಗಕರ್ಮ ಫಲತ್ಯಾಗ ತತ ಕುರುಯತ್ಮವಾನ್ ತತ ಕುರುಯತ್ಮವಾನ್ ಫರ್ಸ್ ಈ ಸೇಸ್ the bhakti yogi you become completely immersed absorbed in god give your place your mind in me place your um, uh, your intellect in me and become absorbed what does it mean i mean first of all easier said than done it's this the most difficult but this is what it really means to be constantly centered in god and completely constantly and completely centered in god that's the highest practice and achievement culmination in the spiritual life just a thing here a subtle point not nothing very difficult but uh, it's good to think about it and when he says place your mind on me mayeva mana adhatsva place your mind in me fix your intellect in me mai buddhim nivesha but what is this mind i'm asking in a very naive way Uh, fix p- place your mind in me i can place the clock on the table here i put i place the clock on the table place the mind in god what is this mind what exactly are you supposed to place what i mean is the mind is immaterial it is formless 
what will you praise so when we talk about the mind practically in our own experience what it means are the things the mind thinks about the thoughts in the mind what are you thinking about so what am i thinking about that i can make it about god so that is that's what is meant by place your mind in me what is placing the mind in me making the thoughts in the mind so there's no other way of catching hold of the mind except the thoughts we have and the thoughts we are, have are about something always the thoughts are about something in philosophy of mind this is called intentionality it it's not intention in the sense in the word we use in english uh, intent means the mind always points to something other than itself it's about something so uh, language also it's usually about something the make it about god that's what is meant by placing the mind in god and the same thing about the intellect the things which the intellect analyzes inquires into make it about god but then we will say yes yes all right but we can't do it uh, we the mind flickers and it's very difficult to focus on something with god it seems rather abstract to us then sri krishna says he steps it down one step a concession then practice the uh, yoga of repetition systematic practice abhyasa yoga in the ninth verse he says abhyasa yoga if you cannot be absorbed in god effortlessly all the time then with effort at particular times in particular places maybe this is my meditation time in the morning this is my puja time in the morning in the evening this is the way i shall think about god this is the mantra i have got this is the way i visualize and so make it a spiritual exercise abhyasa yoga the english translation would be a spiritual exercise abhyasa is repetition but all repetition is not yoga abhyasa yoga is a spiritual exercise an exercise but which is spiritual in nature its goal is spiritual its subject is spiritual now even that is difficult i have been doing it for me but i tend to fall asleep and i find it boring and i am not making any progress well then sri krishna says steps it down further mat karma paramo bhava i uh, says then do something see it's difficult because the mind is subtle so the mind flickers so much arjuna had said to krishna when krishna taught him meditation in the 6th chapter arjuna had objected he had said this meditation you have taught me o oh lord it's next to useless why because practically i can't do it i get what you are trying to say focusing in the mind on god but practically i can't do it the mind flickers he says i might as well try to catch hold of the wind so because of that it's not at all easy uh, even in regular practice morning and evening uh, it bec- at best it's mechanical it's rarely do we get deep uh, profound meditation uh, you will get it but it it's it's very advanced then krishna says all right use the other things which you had not used in meditation the body the senses the speech do something with the body senses and speech you know involve those also if you cannot med- meditate keep keep everything silent and keep the mind on god just the mind on god difficult in that case don't keep silent chant mantras utter prayers um use your hands and feet to go around and do things you know in a temple in in a place of worship in your own home in your shrine have a shrine decorate it light incense do a little ritualistic worship and then the commentators have given other examples of many kinds of spiritual practices that we do pujas we do sankirtan he says singing the names of god chanting um Uh, you know regular reading uh, then um, uh, all of these things are different practices you can do with the body the senses the speech mat karma paramo paramo means it should not be just one of the things that you are doing that should become like the, the center of your life that should become the center of your life a sort of activities throughout the day but all the activities are somehow centered around god I have seen this in um, Vrindavan, for example. I saw um, devotees; many are there who live in Vrindavan, and they have made a 
is it the, the place of Krishna in India? So they have made a routine. The daily routine starts b- before sunrise. And you know, you go to this temple, attend that puja, repeat and do the chanting of the name of Krishna in this place. And this thus it goes on. From morning to afternoon, and the day ends with seeing the arati of Krishna in that that particular temple, uh, repeating the or or in the noon time you take an offered f- food offering to a particular place. Uh, so all of this, a, ba- a bath in the uh, in the Yamuna before that, and before you know it, the day is over. One might say, but you didn't get to do anything else, and the person will say, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to spend the rest of my life doing this. It's not like um, uh, our attitude might be, yeah, yeah, spiritual practices, but get it over with and now move on. Let me get down to my real work in my life. Uh, You know, I have a career and uh, and this and that. Uh, I have this party to go to. I have to get it finished first quickly, my spiritual practices. No, no, no. Not finish that first. That is matkarmo parama. Parama means that is most important in my life. All right. Now there may be people for whom this is also not possible. For many people, uh, and we are talking about spiritual seekers like us. We are not talking about the man on the street. So, for many people, even this is not possible. There are responsibilities, there there is a career, a family, things to be done in the world, which have no direct connection uh, with, with God. In that case, he says, he takes it down one step further, makes it broader and more uh, inclusive, easier. 11th verse Sarva karma phalatyagam tatah kuru yatatmavan In that case do whatever you are supposed to do not do whatever you want to do do whatever you are supposed to do the things because of which you cannot you are saying we we are uh, complaining we have lots of things to do that's why we don't have time to be you know running around temples and <laughs> doing sankirtan and watching the arati all right suppose you cannot do that then the things which you have to do, which are important in your life, then do those. But give it all up mentally to the Lord. So the career that you are pursuing, um, the family that you are raising, mentally you give it up all to the Lord, mentally. Externally you keep on doing exactly what you were doing. And this, by the way, is is not, you know, Oh, it's, it's the lowest, you know, it's meant for uh, really people who are not serious spiritual seekers. No, this is exactly what Arjuna has to do. He, remember, he's talking to Arjuna who is a warrior. He cannot go around doing Sankirtan in the middle of the battle, battlefield and uh, 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 chant the name of Krishna and do puja. They'll shoot him full of arrows if he does that. So he has to fight the battle of life. So when you have to fight the battle of life, make it not about I, me, myself. Make it about God. The Lord has placed me in this battlefield, Kurukshetra. This is the battlefield He has placed me. This is the family. This is the, um, you know, the community. This is my job, or it may be this is my health condition, my financial struggles, my relationship struggles. This is the battlefield I have been put in. Let me do the best that I can, and this is all I give it up to the Lord. The work I am doing and the results which come, good, bad, indifferent. Swami Vivekananda says. I am not interested in any of it. It all belongs to the Lord. If I do well, I am fighting the battle of life. If I do well in the job, if I do a good job of raising the family, good. But I don't want the results thereof. And if I do a bad job, well, the results belong to the Lord anyway. Mm -hmm. I am doing, I am trying. That's it. I may not even be trying too well. But all of that, the crucial point however is one. That you must continuously, we must continuously keep on saying, not I, but thou. This we can do. Although if you if we try it, actually try it, there is something that is not mentioned in the book, but we will all come up against, most of us. If we are ordinary like me, we will come up like, even that there is a resistance in the mind. Even mentally to say it is all thine, it is not mine, uh, it exposes the animal within. It exposes the demon within, which refuses to do even that. Even mentally acknowledging it all belongs to the Lord. I transfer the responsibility mentally to you, the Lord. It's, it's, a, it's an internal shift. We can do it, but there will be a little resistance inside. The resistance shows the unspiritual nature of our you know, 
part, at least part of our, our constitution. That's the resistance to it, which is a very powerful practice. It's not, um, it's not the lowest, it's not, the, it's not for dummies. Uh, it, it, it's a very powerful practice. And often it's the only practical option for most people in the world. Most people can't afford to you know, build their lives around activities for God. Most people cannot, need not only afford to do, they cannot do it also to remain absorbed in meditation hours and hours in a day. And the highest one, of course, that is uh, simply beyond the range of most of us to become instantly absorbed in God and stay there. But this is the foundation. Do we have to stay there? No, we make a beginning here. And over time, you will see your life will become God-centered. You will ascend to that, the, the next higher one. Our work, our life will become God-centered. Then you will see your morning and evening meditations become deep, peaceful, very meaningful source of an otherworldly joy and fulfillment. And one day we will also be become like that, you know, ever absorbed with eyes open and closed in every circumstance, ever absorbed in God. Our mind will be placed in God, our intellect will be fixed in God. So that will happen. One point here though, he says, Tato Kuru Yatatma one. He said, sacrifice everything, mentally offer everything to the Lord and say it is thine, not mine. However, he puts in a crucial point here. A little, what's the word? A rider. In the legal language, a rider. The fine print. Who is he addressing? He says, oh you, the one who is of controlled life. Yatatma one. Your senses and mind are controlled. It's not that I'll lead a wild, reckless life. I'm, Krishna has given me license. I can do exactly what I li like. And then mentally I'll offer it to God. No. Uh, you will do what you consider to be your duty. What we consider to be, what we have to do in this world. And that to lead a careful life. Make At least make an effort. Not to... Uh, uh, indulge in sinful activities, thoughts, in harsh and cruel behavior and speech, uh, things which are clearly against spiritual life, my own, own conscience will tell me. I can't do that and then say, it's all thine, my Lord. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, so I don't want the results of any of this. The results of good work, one can give up. He says, but the results are bad also one can give up, right? Not quite. One Swami put it very nicely. He says, if your job or boss offers you a bonus and says, here is a thousand dollars extra, two thousand, you might say, um, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. But can we put it in the, you know, the company fund for people who need it and all that? And You can give it up if you want to. You can give it up. But if you get a speeding ticket, you say, no, I don't accept it. I, I give it up. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, so if I, if I willfully commit mistakes, I, I lead a reckless life, a sinful life, and I say I, I give up all the results to the Lord, no, it will not work. One has to be careful, n uh, controlled, careful in the life we lead. However, there is... Uh, an addendum, a footnote which one might add, Krishna, and it comes from Krishna. Even if our life is not all that wholesome, all that spiritual, uh, even if it is uh, messy, as most people's lives, to some extent it is, uh, is it hopeless then? Can I not give it up all to the Lord and internally surrender to the Lord? It's, is it not done? No, we can and we should. Krishna himself says that the worst of sinners, the most reckless of lives a person is leading, if that person resolves to become spiritual, from now on my goal is God-realization, I shall progress in spiritual life. Just resolves. He should be known as a Mahatma, a sage. Why? Sambhyak Vyavasito Hisa. Because he has resolved rightly. He has resolved rightly, this person. I will change my life and I want to become a spiritual person. I want to God, spirituality, enlightenment, whichever paradigm you choose in my life, which we all have. So if we have done that, all right, then 
whatever is is there in the life even if it's messy even it's not all that wholesome still keep connecting it to the lord what will happen is krishna himself says kshipram bhavati sa dharmaatma very quickly this person will become a righteous person very quickly so right resolve spirituality is my uh, is what i do it's my goal in life god realization is my goal in life and i'm going to work towards that that's what i want in life that is central if we have that resolve we can keep on surrendering whatever is in our life to the lord and if there is something messy something sinful something not so good that will change pretty fast it will change pretty fast there are examples girish ghosh uh, who surrendered completely to sri ramakrishna he led a pretty bohemian life he was a major uh, figure in bengali 19th century theater in bengal and so on pretty bohemian you know like an artist's life and um and over time he became a saint people used to come monks used to come and go to see see him and listen to him so how did he become a saint that continuous surrender moment to moment to moment you know the story where uh, he uh, he took refuge in sri ramakrishna and sri ramakrishna and asked sri ramakrishna for advice how do i progress in spiritual life how will i see god and sri ramakrishna said you take the name of god the mantra is there girish ghosh re- refused he says i can't promise that my life is so disorderly i don't have a fixed schedule or routine or you know so sri ramakrishna said at least twice in a day before you eat and girish ghosh said no i can't even promise that uh, he was not being uh, uh, obstinate or recalcitrant he was just being honest because i don't know when i eat uh, some days i might not eat so finally sri ramakrishna <laughs> he said uh, oh, then you give me he said all right you rascal you give me the power of uh, attorney give me the power of attorney you know the power of attorney is the person who takes uh, is your legal representative on your behalf you have given him the power to act on your behalf in a legal sense so the power of attorney so from now on all that is necessary in your spiritual life i will do now one might think that's a nice escape clause for me then i can do anything no but girish ghosh learned very soon later he would say i learned very soon at every moment i had to think what would sri ramakrishna have me do in this situation what would he want me to say what would he want me to think and uh, it became a continuous spiritual practice for him so uh whatever or wherever we are as long as we have resolved to be spiritual seekers we can do this we can start mentally um putting the entire burden on the lord but then keep on doing that now so four levels it's as if he is making it easier and easier and easier one sadhu who joked that uh, people who ask how and what's the practice what's the method you might say yeah, that's a good question but not really some are very stuck up on the method uh, how do i realize god well love god keep your mind on keep your mind on god like krishna says and the man asks yeah but how do i keep my mind on god to so, love god whatever you love your mind will be on that yes but how do i love god um well stay with holy people who love god it's infectious you will catch it uh, read the lives of the saints uh, think about that um well wh- where do i find holy people well if you can't then <laughs> ashokan ji there's a letter very interesting letter he's writing to an american lady in san francisco in the 1950s uh, she has i don't know we don't know what she has written we, we can summarize he writes back to her saying that madam i'm happy to know that you are seeking holy company but the real real question is do the holy want your company <laughs> <laughs> true the holy might not want our company but they're kind at least a little bit of the time they'll give us <laughs> so all right where do i find holy company then the monk said to him well all right at least uh, read the books but i don't have time well um, at least then take the name of god morning and evening i may not be able to take the name of god morning and evening uh, well at least once in a day sometime 
uh, every day? <laughs> Can I do it like maybe once in a week or a month? I said, all right. But sit, sit, sit intensely, take the name of God at intensely at least once a week, you know, when you have a holiday or something. Mm. Um, or once a month. Um, and then he says, uh, in a year, maybe once, one, one t- on occasion. Uh, in Hindi, he said, Saal mein ek bar? And he said, all right, maybe that will also to make it to begin with. And then finally, th- this is a joke actually. At the end of it, he says, uh, and if I don't do it, that's also all right. <laughs> so that was the whole point of it. <laughs> no, we have to do, we have to start here at the, and as you notice on another thing, all of the, these being absorbed in the thought of God, regular meditation, morning and evening, doing something directly related to the Lord in your own shrine or in the temple or wherever. And continuously giving up whatever we are doing, mentally giving up the work and the result to the Lord. So, all of these can go on together. They should. Now, twelfth one, the twelfth verse, Sri Krishna sums up this teaching on what is to be done. These four levels of practices, he sums them up. Twelfth verse. Shreyo hi jnanam abhyasat Shreyo hi jnanam abhyasat Jnana dhyanam vishishyate Jnana dhyanam vishishyate Dhyana karma phala tyaga Dhyana karma phala tyaga Tyaga shanti ranantaram Knowledge is superior to practice. Meditation is superior to knowledge. Superior to meditation is renunciation of the fruit of action. From renunciation results peace immediately. So it sums up the four levels of practices. Um, He says here, regular practice, it's good. But better than that is knowledge. That, that means a practice done with understanding. Whatever practice you are doing. And uh, higher than understanding is meditation on that understanding. Dhyanam. And higher than meditation, he says, is uh, renunciation of the fruits of action. Which was said just now in the 11th. And from the renunciation of the fruits of action, it is giving up everything to the Lord. You get peace immediately. But this seems a little weird because he should have said the highest of all is meditation, being absorbed in God. A little lower than that may be the knowledge of the scriptures and understanding. A little lower than that is the practice and all and the work that you do. And finally, the lowest of all, the most preliminary of all, the beginning is giving up the results of action. But he says giving up the results of action is the highest. All right, but, but how do you explain it? How is it the highest? And uh, giving up the ego, uh, instead of saying that, see, when, when in the 11th verse he said it, he said it, it is a pretty easy way of say, doing it, you know. Instead of saying ego, I have the ego, but I'm using the ego to say that it's not mine, it's all yours. It's something that you can, but he, if you give up the ego itself, that's very difficult. I'll, I'll tell you what's going on here. I'll tell you means on the based on the commentators. The commentators say that, yes, actually this is the most preliminary, the basic one, the where, where we all begin. That is giving up everything to the Lord mentally. This is one what one can do. You might say it's not sincere. It doesn't matter if it's sincere. Start. Start. Don't be like that person. How? <laughs> <laughs> the real answer to how is start. Make a beginning. You will see how when you start doing it. So, um, make a beginning by mentally giving up, acknowledging that the, it is... The Lord, it is thine. These people are yours. This job is yours. The, the what I get from the job, the the, uh, the monetary gains, the praise that I get from it, the scoldings that I get from it, whatever is going on, it's all thine. And empty yourself out mentally to the Lord. It's all thine. Even this body, this the powers of the senses of the mind, all these, these are all provided by you. They are you. And they are yours. You start there. And then slowly one can develop further and then 
uh, all the others will come in their own good time as we become more and more competent in spiritual life as we advance in spiritual life therefore this continuous surrender of the results of action is the foundation for all of these this is where we can begin everybody can begin here mentally surrendering what we have right now what we are experiencing right now in our lives mentally surrendering acknowledging connecting it to the lord at least that everybody can do and we can all begin there the others might be more difficult so in that sense it's the highest um the word used by the, all the commentators actually is stuti praise this might be the preliminary one but don't treat it with uh, with disdain oh this is a, this is for dummies i want the higher practices you know the more sophisticated practices a shortcut no don't treat it with disdain this is very powerful and this will take you to the highest so you start here and then meditation and knowledge and all of those things will come don't forget your question hold on to that all right so this is one answer to this question why is this language this phrased in such a way this verse which is making what seems to be the most preliminary practice it's praising that as the best because uh, it is the foundation for all that's where everybody can begin uh, and that has been praised uh, so and sadhu said it's like saying in hindi they say shabash beta good my boy well done my boy you are encouraging a kid so in that sense well done start here so that's one but this can be interpreted from the uh, in the paradigm of the path of knowledge gyana yoga and a different interpretation i'll i'll give you that interpretation however uh, that might not fit the context here but it makes sense it says higher than repetition abhyasa is knowledge so what is the practice of yani yoga shravana manana nididhyasana hearing that means attending classes studying higher than this continuously you know attending classes lots of youtube talks and notes and i remember uh, one of our novices when i was a novice this was about 30 years ago we were newcomers uh, brahmacharis every day in the morning there was a class and uh, one of my friends another novice a very simple boy he would sit very see and we had to sit on the mat on the floor of on, on the roof of the monastery and the swami in charge of the whole ashram he would teach us every day except sundays so six days a week one hour after breakfast and we the novices would sit around him on the mat it was usually uh, early morning so it was pleasant and this brahmacharya my friend he would sit with a diary and uh, he would take copious notes whatever the swami was saying whatever the books were saying he would take lots of notes now the time came when he had to go away to the main monastery for advanced training and so he looked at me and he said you know when i am leaving i have got something to give you i thought oh oh he says i have these extensive notes for the last 3 years classes all those diaries i would like to leave those with you i said no thank you i don't need them <laughs> so just listening higher than that is shravana manana when you have listened studied and thought over it and got it when you say i get it many people say i get it that's good that's superior to just blindly you know listening and studying i'm talking about the path of knowledge but higher than getting it through shravana and manana hearing and reasoning higher than that is what we have got you've got it congratulations now what do you do you stay with what you have got because what you have got is i am brahman this witness consciousness which is not body and mind is limitless non dual brahman this is i'm getting an idea of that or i'm getting some understanding of that some grounding in that all right if you have got clarity about it stay with it in regular meditation nididhyasana vedantic meditation non dual meditation meditation is higher than just knowledge knowledge means what i've got what i've understood meditation is stay with it and higher than that he says that meditation here's a very subtle point when you are doing that 
uh, non-dual meditation, let go of the expected result of that meditation. This will make sense to those who have done that, you know, that, a kind of advanced meditation, a very subtle level of the mind, where even the expectation waiting for that enlightenment to arise will be a disturbance. That's also an activity of the mind. Let go. So, Tyagat Shanti Ranantaram, immediately after letting go of that expectation of result, will follow the, the deep peace that enlightenment brings with it. So, this is another alternative interpretation. All right. Um, yes. If you have not forgotten your question. Do you want to bring the microphone? Yes. Uh, raise your hand so that he can bring the microphone to you. Tell us your name and ask the question. I'm Hari. And uh, the question is, so if we, moment to moment, if we start offering our fruit of action to the Lord, how to function in the world? Because I've done that and it's, it becomes hard to function in the society, to stay motivated to do uh, the daily responsibilities. Um, what tips would I you have for that? Oh, it becomes difficult to do our daily responsibilities because again I've, I've mm. tried doing this moment to moment mm. not just because like not uh, like an hour hourly basis like moment to moment I've really tried literally that, moment so. to moment even if you so if you keep thinking about that it might be difficult to put your attention on what you're supposed to do that I agree yeah. but that need not be for example what we do in the monastery many devotees also do Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu we'll do that after finishing the class so I offer everything up to the Lord the work itself and the results of this work, everything goes to the Lord. So I'm, as Vivekananda says, we are blessed to have been called out to, to play our parts in this, in this field of action. You know. That's the attitude. We are very happy that we have got this opportunity. It's, we are truly blessed. It's a grand thing to be part of wherever the Lord puts us. So you don't have to do it moment to moment in that sense. One must, even the puja, or if one is doing a puja, if one remains completely absorbed in thought of the Lord, you will make a mess of the puja. That's interesting. Sri Ramakrishna in Dakshineshwar, he was worshipping the, the Divine Mother. Sometimes he would put the flower meant to put at, at, uh, you know, at the feet of Kali uh, on his own head. Uh, sometimes he would feed, he would offer the uh, sacred food to, at, the, you know, to, at the image of Kali. Sometimes he would <laughs> offer it to himself. Some, once he offered it to the cat. Now, <laughs> Yeah, I, I once saw a book um, on cats, which started with that uh, uh, with that uh, anecdote, and then there was nothing about Ramakrishna anymore after that. It was about cats. So the rest of the book was. Uh, so, so yes, as long if you can automatically remain absorbed in the thought of God, nothing greater than that. But if not, and then uh, occasionally. From time to time, every few hours after finishing a work, eating for example, I offer it to the Lord, mentally it becomes prasad, so I, um, you know, take, I'm taking prasad, whatever I'm eating, even if it's a cup of tea, uh, if I'm uh, taking a cup of tea with a cookie or something, it's still prasad, you offer it to the Lord. Here's a subtle point. From the perspective of the law of karma, you know, karma, good work gives rise to good results. And uh, impious, immoral work gives rise to um, demerit, or bad results. So good, good, bad, bad. That's the law of karma. The thing is not to give rise to results. And when Sadhu said, Worldly people are so incautious, asavdhan in, in Hindi, so incautious. Even when they are experiencing the results of their actions, bhoga, results, they are enjoying something which they have got because of past good karma. It could be eating, enjoyment, uh, um, you know, money, relationships, fame, success, whatever it is. Even when they are enjoying it, they are giving rise to new results. The way they enjoy it. I am having the time of my life and I want more of this and it is mine and I deserve it gives rise to more result, more karma phala. You're generating new karma. Or the other way around, suffering. 
the way they suffer it gives rise to more results in the future and he says the Mahatma is just the opposite let alone the results even when the Mahatma is doing karma that karma also does not give rise to any more results the karma he converts the karma into karma yoga you see what he is saying he is saying generally the idea is if you do karma it will give rise to results and the results are something that we experience the wise man the wise person the yogi does karma in such a way the karma will not give rise to f fresh results you know offering it to God karma yoga and experiences the results continuously offering it up to the Lord so that that does not generate future that does not itself become a karma and generate future results and the unwise person the worldly person not only the karma it expects and wants the karma to generate results if it's good karma good and bad karma both generate results and the results of the karma when this person is experiencing the way this person experiences that also becomes new karma for future results and you get trapped anyway that's just an observation now um, next comes the rest of the chapter is like a list of attributes or qualities and these are qualities of the enlightened person now there's a question here what kind of enlightened person are we talking about the answer straightforward answer would be the devotee because it's bhakti yoga who the advanced devotee the self-realized the enlightened one the one who has already experienced God the God realized devotee so the qualities which you find in such a devotee well that might be so but when you look at the qualities it's interesting um, Shankaracharya, Badhusud and Saraswati, they are pretty straight, they straight away say this is, these are the qualities you find in the Jnani. <laughs> in the enlightened pa person, um, the path of knowledge, the person who is already enlightened. But what kind of Jnani? The Jnani Bhakta, the one who is enlightened, who has got self-knowledge and that I am Brahman and is devoted to God. Are such is it possible certainly it's possible and you see the lives of the saints enlightened ones they have full self-knowledge that I am Brahman and uh, in almost every case whether explicitly or implicitly they have great devotion for God it's difficult to find out what's the real nature of the of the enlightened one so uh, Swami Vivekananda said about himself and about Sri Ramakrishna he said um, he was bhakti on the outside, inside, he said the old man, the old man was bhakti on the outside, inside he was all jnana, knowledge. And I am Brahman, he was absolutely established in that. Advaya tattva samahita chitta, projvala bhakti patavrita vritta. The ma whose mind was completely absorbed in the non-dual reality, but outwardly clothed in the radiant cloth of love, bhakti. That was Sri Ramakrishna. And about himself, he says, I am jnana on the outside. Uh, inside, I am all love. I am all love. Bhakti. So, uh, it's not easy to understand who is uh, uh, jnani, who is bhakta. Some, sometimes then, highly advanced spiritual persons may be one thing on the outside, one attitude, spiritual attitude on the outside, another thing internally. So, according to Madhusudan Saraswati, according to Shankaracharya, these are um, the characteristics of the Jnani Bhakta. And it's not contradictory. Krishna himself has said, there are four kinds of devotees. Artha, Artharthi, Artha, Jignasu, Artharthi, Jnani Cha. Devotees are of four kinds. Those who come to God in, in, in trouble. Uh, Artha, in distress, in trouble. Those who come to God when they want, they are not in trouble, but they want something in this world, something worldly. Power, success, something, one thing. Or just blessings so that things go well in the world. And then the third one is Jigyasu, the inquirer, who wants to know, does God exist, can I realize God, uh, how can I realize God and so on, the inquirer, Jigyasu. And then the last one is Jnani, the enlightened one. The enlightened one, <coughs> the enlightened one, the enlightened one is also a devotee of God. Enlightened one is also devotee. Enlightened in the sense of I am Brahman. That realization has come. Self knowledge is also a devotee of God. <coughs> Sorry. 
such a one also loves God. And then Krishna proceeds to say, the enlightened one is, is, is dearest to me. Is dearest to me. So the one on the path of knowledge, who is also a bhakta, uh, that person's characteristics are mentioned. You find these lists three times, four times in the Bhagavad Gita. The lists of the perfected one, the enlightened one. The, the list means the characteristics, attributes. Why are they given? First, they describe the ultimate goal. What uh, what is the enlightened one like? What what do we expect when we dis when we feel that? You now, when we think we'll we'll be enlightened, what will it be like being enlightened? And important, the second reason why these lists are given is those are practices for the rest of us. Shankaracharya says that those which are naturally the attributes of enlightened ones are practices for the rest of us who are seeking enlightenment. So, in the second chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, Sthita Pragyasya Lakshana, the characteristics of the one est of established wisdom. I am Brahman, that is realized and established, it becomes effortless, the realization that I am Brahman. What are the characteristics of such a person? Arjun asks this question in the sec end of the second chapter, and a beautiful sequence, Sthita Pragya, beautiful sequence, so, a whole of Vedanta is packed in there. So that was, but that's, from so that, that's one, one list then another list you find here in the 12th chapter here again the characteristics of the enlightened one are given again these are practices for the rest of us but uh, uh, here it's slightly different from that that list that list if you want to make a distinction that list is shown from enlightened one from the perspective of karma um, because the whole of the second chapter was Arjuna's question, what sh should I do this, should I not do this, if I do this, how do I do this? So if you are enlightened, then how will you do this, the duty before you, the battle of life, how will you fight the battle of life after being enlightened? That was how that uh, list uh, is set. This one is set in Bhakti Yoga. So again the characteristics of the enlightened one, but in, um, in the format of a devotee of God, a lover of God. Again, we will come across another such list in the next chapter, 13th chapter, where a list of uh, qualities. But those are the qualities for the jigyasu, the inquirer on the path of knowledge. Those who are seeking enlightenment, self-realization, I am Brahman, that kind of realization we are seeking. Then what are the practices for us? Uh, but those are advanced practices uh, on the path of knowledge. We will come across that in 13th chapter. In fact, if you see the, Vedan the Ramakrishna mission in Singapore, uh, last year I gave a series of talks there, advanced practices in Vedanta. So those were based on the practices given in the 13th chapter. But they are meant for those who are seeking self-knowledge. I am Brahman. And there are similar lists in the 14th chapter and 18th chapter, but those are, again, a little different. <laughs> now we are going to have from 13th verse to the 20th verse. 13th verse to 20th verse, the rest of the chapter are the characteristics of the perfect, the enlightened uh, bhakta, enlightened person and lover of God, together, the characteristics and practices for the rest of us on the path. 13 and 14 are, take, are to be taken together. Adveshta sarva bhutanam, Adveshta sarva bhutanam, Maitra Karuna Evacha, Maitra Karuna Evacha, Nirmamo Nirahankara, Nirmamo Nirahankara, Sama Dukha Sukhakshami, Sama Dukha Sukhakshami, Santushta Satatam Yogi, Santushta Satatam Yogi, Yatat Madrida Nishaya, Yatatma Drida Nishaya, Mayar Pita Mano Buddhi, Mayar Pita Mano Buddhi, Yomad Bhakta Same Priyaha, Yomad Bhakta Same Priyaha. Non envious, friendly, and compassionate towards all beings, free from ideas of possession and ego consciousness, sympathetic in pain and pleasure. Forgiving, always contented, contemplative, self-controlled, of firm conviction, 
with his mind and intellect dedicated to me such a devotee of mine is dear to me all right so this is the jnani the enlightened one who is a devotee of of krishna a devotee of god advesta sarvabhutanam dvesha means aversion dislike uh, and it can intensify into anger and hatred dvesha So these are the two words used again and again in Vedanta. Raga dvesha. Raga means inordinate affection, attraction, addiction, attachment. Raga, a pull. And dvesha means aversion, dislike. It could be towards persons. It could be towards uh, objects. It could be towards uh, food, activities, job, place, uh, just things in life in general. strong attraction and strong dis- strong attractions and dislikes are a s- sign of ignorance why so because after all what is vedanta teaching there is only one non differentiated limitless non dual brahman that alone exists everything that we experience everybody that we experience every thought and feeling behind it all is one limitless brahman god god alone is appearing in all these ways so if we have strong likes and dislikes for one particular thing this alone to the exclusion of other things other people other jobs other activities other practices or i don't like that at all we are making a mistake we are our focus is on the name and form on the appearance rather than the reality so we are making a mistake somewhere one monk put it nicely that um how do i know that i have fallen in the trap of raga dvesha strong aversion and uh, attachments attachment raga if something some activity person food whatever it is job place it pulls me regardless of how much price i have to pay for it how much um, effort i have to put into it how much shame and uh, um, you know dishonor i have i am uh, put through all of this i am willing to put up with to get that yeah. to have that it is raga it's a strong case of course a pretty bad case of raga but raga and the dvesha the opposite if there is something or somebody of whom of which thing or person i cannot see a single good point of at all then there is dvesha there is strong aversion in my mind because in either case there is something wrong so advesta sarvabhutanam without aversion towards whom towards everybody the first this is the first thing in spiritual life especially in devotion in love love and hate cannot stay together at the same place even in worldly love when you love somebody intensely genuinely deeply you will have a, such a gladness lightness and happiness in the in the heart you cannot strongly hate some other person some other thing you cannot have these two two uh, feelings together in the heart so this hate aversion uh, this has to we have to let go of this you have to begin here this is the beginning that i i cannot um, stop hating disliking uh, that person or something uh, that that ideology that religion uh, uh, that uh, race that um, uh, whatever it is whatever in my life especially people especially sentient beings aversion one must give up advesta sarvabhutanam whatever it does to the object of that aversion the person i dislike whatever it does to that person that's later first of all it damages destroys my spiritual life spiritual life is a very high thing it will destroy my peace of mind in day to day aversion dislike is like a fire is like a fire if i light the fire first i have to light the fire of dislike in my own heart and the fire burns the place where it is lit first it will burn the other thing later on but first it will burn the place where you light that fire first i'll burn and then the other person if i direct that fire at him but so spiritual life is not possible i'm reminded immediately in the bible jesus christ says if you have ought, if you have got something to offer to to the lord 
to your father, you have got something to offer, and you have ought against your brother, you have, who are holding something against your brother, somebody, then leave that offering. Go and make amends with your brother. At least try. Then come back. Otherwise, he says, the father will not accept your offering. God will not accept your offering. It's another way of saying psychologically one cannot be genuinely spiritual if you have a grudge which is burning in your mind. That, see, dvesha, aversion is a samskara, is a conditioning, a negative conditioning in the mind. When it becomes a vritti, a conscious thought in the mind, it, it'll, it's like a seed. It will come up once in a while. If we, if we have, if we nurture, nourish the seeds of aversion in our mind, they will come up once in a while as anger, irritation, uh, um, nasty thoughts in the mind. And it, in the mind it becomes, so the, 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 the conditioning, the samskara of aversion will arise in the mind as anger. Then it will go further. It will go to the, from the mind to the level of the senses, at the level of the motor organs and our uh, our uh, um, you know speech as nasty hard words harsh words and then physically also you may throw a punch at a person or something or do do stuff yes people hurt themselves in anger sometimes there is a funny story of you know you've heard the story of why the little girl kicked the kitten no you haven't the little girl a poor, a very poor family. She kicked the kitten. Why? Why did she kick the kitten? It's because uh, her mom um, beat her. Uh, the, why did the mom beat the little girl? Because the mom was a maid servant in a rich man's house, and the lady of the house yelled at her that day, uh, had you know unfairly scolded her. So the mom was mad, at, but she couldn't say anything to the lady because <laughs> she is an employer. Why did the lady yell at her? It was because her husband yelled at her. Why did the husband yell at her? Because the boss yelled at him in the office. <laughs> so the husband couldn't say anything to the boss. So he yelled at his wife. The wife, instead of uh, you know giving it back to the husband, she yelled at the maid servant. And the maid servant came and slapped the little girl. And so the little girl, <laughs> what, what could she do? She kicked the kitten. <laughs> so it's finally expressed in physical action, anger. So, but it all starts with dvesha. Uh, the dislike, deep dislike inside. Uh, so Adveshta. For whom? Sarva Bhutanam. For everybody. For everybody. Don't keep special lists of enemies. Hmm? I'm going to put you on my list. Top 10 enemies. No. There's nobody who's your enemy. By the way, here one has to be a little careful. Have no aversion towards anybody. Literally, even people who are against you, who have actually deliberately actually harmed you, tried to harm you. Don't keep it, because that's not a wise thing to do. As Vivekananda said, it is the fool who cannot get angry. The wise person does not get angry. So, don't nurture anger against anybody. Even people you think are bad, who have harmed you. However, however, there actually are bad people. Bad people in the sense that people who will harm you, and if you allow them, they will ruin not only your worldly life, your spiritual life also. So there Sri Ramakrishna's uh, warning that yes, Narayana is everywhere, but that doesn't mean, in Bengali he said, Bhag Narayan ke alingon kotta, we will not go and embrace the tiger Narayana. <laughs> the tiger Narayana, if you embrace Narayana God, the tiger God, if you go and embrace the tiger God in, out of love, that tiger God will embrace you. <laughs> I saw a video on YouTube, um, that there's, you won't believe it, there, there are videos on YouTube of, uh, of tigers eating people up. They're blurred. <laughs> Two examples, both in a zoo in China. Two zoos, different zoos. And, uh, and notice the source of being eat, uh, literally being eaten up by a tiger. Uh, one was um, this lady who was uh, fighting against her husband. So it's a, it's a park. This is famous on YouTube, the video is there. It's like a national park and uh, you can drive through it. So there are tigers and lions around, but you just don't roll down your windows, that's all. So you drive, the, you can see the camera shows the car coming and it's stopping. Um, and this lady, she clearly gets down in a huff 
she is getting down from the car so that she can walk around and sit in the front seat or something doesn't want to sit um, or she is going to go and sit in the back seat and her mom was there and her husband was there she was fighting with the husband i think so she wanted to sit in the back seat or something she got down in a, you can see she is walking in half so it's interesting dvesha anger it's revealed in your body language also when you storm out of something she gets out and before she can enter the car from the other side a, a huge tiger in a split second comes uh, jumps out grabs hold of her and drags her away into the bush and the husband is there but he is hesitant he doesn't know <laughs> what to do whether he should go and rescue her or not the one who does not hesitate for one second also is the old mother she jumps out of the car and rushes into the bush straight in and within uh, within a minute it's a very efficient uh, rangers came and that's how the video cuts out nothing more is there uh, the lady i think she survived um the rangers rescued her the old mother died the, the tiger killed her um so that was one incident anger anger fighting led to that the other one was again another zoo in china where this family this gentleman and his friend he wanted to save on uh, the entrance uh, entrance fee his wife and kid went in with the and paid the entrance fee this gentleman uh, he thought why pay so much and it was an expensive zoo um, a zoo so he uh, went to the wall and he climbed it and he saw there was another wall after that so he thought all right let's climb this i'm uh, let's see this through he didn't know the other other side it, it there were tigers <laughs> so he climbed it and uh, jumped in and the tigers ate him up the tigers couldn't believe this <laughs> their luck <laughs> yes but i was thinking in why did it happen in both cases one out of anger another out of greed uh, anyway okay uh, don't go to the, that that's the no but follow the rules when you go to the zoo adveshta sarva bhutanam and then maitra karuna eva cha and for those who are happy enjoy the happiness of those who are happy you see this is the nasty side to our, our uh, nature is when we see somebody successful happy making it well in life we don't like it all that much <laughs> ah all right either we cut it down their success or at most we wish i could, i wish it could be me but that person is happy right now is doing well has got the award at 1 million dollars or whatever uh, is uh, doing well in life in in uh, in profession or whatever it is be happy for that person just as it is without bringing myself into it or wishing that he wouldn't be so successful uh, and a distant person is still it's it's okay if uh, we say elon musk got another billion dollars we say wow that's great but if your neighbor or your cousin <laughs> gets a Uh, a raise in the uh, in the job uh, we tend to burn up with jealousy so no other way around maitra friendliness happiness uh, in the joy of others karuna this enlightened one who is a devotee lover of god those who are in suffering those who are not as well off as we are whether it's in money or knowledge or whatever it is and those who are actually suffering a heart should melt our hard heart should melt sri krishna says elsewhere we have already seen this um atma upamme na sarvatra samam pashyati yo arjuna sukham va yadi va dukham sayogi paramo matha krishna says to arjuna who sees other beings as themselves in pain or in joy as i am in if i am in pain in suck in failure in physical pain in illness i suffer so this person is also suffering i feel that pain as mine and when i am enjoying i am happy this person is also enjoying so i feel happy about it i feel the pain of others as my own pain i feel the happiness of others as my own own happiness he says that yogi is the best yogi not the one who can sit still with eyes closed for a very long time that's good but uh, this yogi is the best yogi vivekananda 
when that young boy came to him in India, he said, the young boy said to him, Swami, I close all the doors and windows of my room and sit and meditate for long hours, but I have no peace of mind. And Vivekananda said, open the doors and windows of your room. Go out there. There is the sick man. Nurse him. There is the, the there are those illiterate. There are those who are hungry. They teach the illiterate. Uh, give food to the uh, hungry. You will find peace of mind. The peace of mind which you are seeking, you will find peace of mind. Karuna evacha, compassion for those who are suffering. Then nirmamo nirahankara samadukha sukhakshami. I'll quickly go through this, but these are all very deep things. Um, in fact, we have really gone over time. There's a lot to be said about these things. So I'll keep it for next time. But you have to remember that we did not complete 13 and 14. So we have to start in the middle of 13 and 14 again. Nirmamo nirahankara. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Um The basket? Yes. If anybody has any questions or observations, you can use this time to raise your hand and ask. Them. Yes, the gentleman back there. You. Yes. We can ask the question. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sorry, I have two questions. What's your name? Prasoon. Prasoon. Uh, my first question is, did uh, Sri Ram or Sri Krishna have hate or a grudge for Ravan or Kans? Yes. So do they have a grudge? No, actually they don't. Um, you will find they did it as their duty or to get rid of people who were evildoers. But they had never any ha hatred. Notice, even if you go, uh, you don't have to go back to mythical times. You come to a modern time, someone like, say, Mahatma Gandhi, fighting for the freedom of India against the British colonizers. But he carefully kept hatred of the British out of his heart. And everybody felt it, including the British themselves. There is no hatred. Okay. Yes. Um, but, but it's Martin Luther King here, fighting for the rights of uh, African Americans, but he had no hatred for uh, you know white supremacists. No hatred there. If you do that, you are it's self-defeating. You're creating it. It will engender more hatred in the other side. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my second question is, uh, I was reading the Yoga Sutras. I didn't finish, so it might be later on, but. Uh, they're talking about different le levels of samadhi. Yes. And uh, it mentioned how some yogis would get stuck at the prior levels before reading, uh, reaching uh, some, pr I forget the name, but the mm. final level of samadhi. Um, and because of the chapter, I was wondering, is bhakti the key of reaching the final level of samadhi and not getting stuck in the, the bhakti schools would say so the uh, patanjali yoga would, does not however patanjali yoga actually says in one place in one of the sutras uh, ishvara pranidhanatva all of this can be achieved through the through the worship of god it's something that does not figure in the general scheme in patanjali yoga which is a kind of just relying on meditation but here, uh, the sutra says, if you worship God, by love of God, all these things can be achieved. So it, there is an option there. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there was one more person. Yes, you can just ask. Are you truly offering to God? Uh, I? Are you truly offering anything to God? First start, it might seem like lip service, but the more we think about it, the more we understand what God is, what we are, we begin to see it is true. It actually, all of it does belong to God. The actions that we do, this body which we are using, the thoughts which we are using, the materials we are using, the people around us, literally they belong to God. Who else? If there is God, it must that God must be responsible for all of this. So when we offer, we are actually acknowledging a truth. If we do not offer, we are living lives of falsity. It is mine. I am the doer. No, it's not true. It's not true. Yeah. All of it is the Lord. The Lord is the doer and the instruments of action, the objects which are being used in action, the people involved in this drama of life, 
all of them belong to the Lord. And we're just acknowledging it. So the more we think about it, and the more we actually start doing it, we develop a feel for it. Yeah. It works. Yeah. It's a very powerful practice. Very powerful practice. Anger, Even anger, everything. Even anger. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Yes. He lost the habit. He said, offered the wine to the uh, to to the Lord. And there was a very uh, interesting instruction given by uh, Sri Ramakrishna to Girish Kosh. He couldn't stop drinking. And he took the step of. It's uh, it's not considered to be a holy thing which you can offer, but he did it. And over time, uh, the result was not that he became an even more uh, deep alcoholic. <laughs> no. He actually came out of it. Because the more you think of the pure, the high, the transcendent, the more those qualities come into you. That's how the mind works. That's at the psychological level, but there's a deeper reason. You are you're connecting yourself to a source, a great power, a great source of help. That's more important. Yeah. All right. I think we have already done the peace chant. Yes. And there are multiple practices that he undertook. The multiple practices. At one time he says it was Rama. Another time it was light in, at, at his youth. The, the ones which he has mentioned. But there must have been multiple things because Sri Ramakrishna put him through a series of exercises. Yeah. 